Hello, this is Cindy Mazzaferro with Powerful Beyond Measure, and I'm so excited to have Michelle McConchie. Is that the right way of saying it, Michelle? Um, it's McConaughey. McConaughey, and I apologize. So, McCon uh, Michelle, you're in actually New Zealand, is that right? I am. We're just starting fall out, out here, so it's the beginning of autumn, um, and it's a beautiful day. I'm in the South Island in Christchurch. Oh, I bet it must be gorgeous. It must be gorgeous. So hopefully our internet connection works well. So if there is a momentary pause as we go through this every so often, please just realize it is that we are flying through the sky on <laughs> two continents and hopefully we'll have no problems. So let me tell you a little bit about Michelle before we actually talk about her amazing new book that's out there. So these days, Michelle teaches creative writing classes herself, teaching both homeschooled children and adults at a night class. She has written a trilogy for middle grade readers called The Strange Sagas of Sabrina Summers. And the first book in, the, in that trilogy is The Uncooperative Flying Carpet, which is being published by Morgan James, the children's section. She is working on a travel book of sites that she has visited, which inspired classic British children's books. She also teaches academic English at a local college. So welcome, Michelle. Wonderful to have you here today. Lovely to meet you, Cindy, especially since I enjoyed Powerful Beyond Measure so much and found it so helpful. Oh, great. Thank you for saying that. That's very sweet of you. So uh, do you have a copy of your book that you can show everyone? I do. I don't have a copy of the new um, version from Morgan James, but I've got um, my old one. So just bear with me while I grab it. Oh, from sure. My I should have asked for it before. And for those of you waiting, um, while we're waiting for her to get it, um, I will be showing a picture of the new book cover along with this um, YouTube link um, to this interview. So it's an amazing book and a wonderful book for young children. Let's see what you got, Michelle. Wonderful. So here we go. Yeah. This is... The version that I've printed, um, I've, I've had permission from Morgan James to self-publish a version that is especially for dyslexic readers. This is that version. So it's quite thick, as you can see compared to normal children's books, because inside the font is much larger. Um, and that's a particular font that I have a license to use called Dyslexi which was um, produced after a great deal of scientific research uh, by a Dutch company. Um, and it's supposed to be the most effective tool for readers who are dyslexic. So that's available on amazon.com for all dyslexics. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, let me first ask you, what is dyslexia? I know, but let's tell the audience here. Um, it's, an, it's a processing issue between the eye and the brain. Um, it's not a learning difficulty or in any way a disadvantage except that often we don't um, help dyslexic readers or just help dyslexic students by giving them the tools that they need so it's just a, pro a different way of processing so by using a larger font that helps them to um, assimilate the content and the reading ability for it that's right and the fonts many of the letters are weighted at the bottom so they're darker at the bottom or at the sides which makes it much easier for them to differentiate. And there's a, a ragged margin along the right-hand side, so it's not on glaring white paper, it's on cream paper, um, and it's much softer on the eye for them to be able to focus on the words and focus on the story instead of focusing on trying to understand the jumbling ants moving across the page sensation that dyslexic readers can suffer from. So it probably changes their perception of the page depth, the letters, by yeah. using those subtle changes in the letters. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, that's a great tool for um, young children or, or adults that are um, experiencing dyslexia to be able to still enjoy the wisdom and the um, just the interest and joy of reading a book. So that's great. A absolutely. <laughs> So tell me, why did you want to write this trilogy? And let's, we're, we're actually having you unleash the, um, the uncooperative flying carpet. Tell us a little bit about the book and what you're hoping the um, readers will take away from it. Um, well, I'm quite surprised to be sitting here talking about having written a children's book at all. Um, I always wanted to write um, mysteries for adults. I loved Agatha Christie and the golden age of detective fiction from the 1930s and 40s and thought I would write books like that. Um, and then I was lucky enough to become an aunt and then lucky enough to become a stepmother and write stories for my 
niece who is called Erin and she's grown up now to being a wonderful young woman in the UK just about to graduate from university mm. and my stepdaughter Stephanie um, so there were stories that featured them and starred them to made them laugh um, and this trilogy grew from a story that I wrote for my stepdaughter um, and I just had so much more fun writing that um, than I ever thought possible and wanted to just keep going so I just thought oh, I'll write maybe one book and it's now it's a trilogy and I'm also writing short stories called Tales from Dralfinia which will be um, an ebook um, for people uh, who, who've enjoyed the stories and didn't want it to stop either really. <laughs> oh, so it'll be continue on from the trilogy additional sort of stories oh that was a yeah. part of you yeah yeah great so I noticed in your bio uh, a little bit of you, what you shared to me is that you were a very reluctant and shy uh, child growing up. Now, how yes. does that play or interweave in your characters in your book? Um, I think I was, I was very shy um, indeed. It was, um, you know, if the teacher called on me in class, I would practically faint. Um, and it took a long time just to grow out of it. And I made myself become a teacher um, so that I had to stand in front of a class, which was, I must have been a glutton for punishment. Um, but I was never happier than sitting and reading quietly in my room by myself. And I still am, really. And to think that now I also write stories. And I think um, many readers are the same. I think, you know, many readers and writers are quite introverted. Uh, my characters aren't introverted particularly. Sabrina is um, a fairly confident person but she does find herself pushed to be a leader and she um, is reluctant to at first um, but I think it's really important that girls know um, that they can be le leaders and just in the same way that boys can um, and for me I think my experience of making myself do things that were very much out of my comfort zone um, comes out in the books. I think Sabrina has to do things that she doesn't really want to do, but um, she makes herself and it works out for the best. <laughs> well, I think that's such a great role model and, and being able to see that in the character development and the storyline and the, um, what happens throughout the story to actually show and demonstrate that women can, like you say, um, experience struggles, experience, I'm not real comfortable with this, but then also take that leadership role and um, yep. be more into action dynamic and, and really get the results and see results in your life. So I think that's really helpful for all, both men and girls, but yeah. this character, Sabrina, is a girl, so um, it's yeah. a great message. And I've so, taught for many years and taught teenagers and I'd often see teenage girls walking around with their heads down and not looking up and clinging on to a boyfriend and all they ever wanted in life was to have a boyfriend um, and um, and they were capable of so much more they never really achieved their potential um, and it's it means such a lot to me to be able to say to people like that oh you can be resilient and it might be a bit hard but um, feel free to grow and develop and be the amazing man or woman that you could be wonderful it's like really not having limits you know being powerful beyond measure like, like my absolutely book. <laughs> absolutely so what is it your hope when readers read your book young adults read your book what would you like to see them taken away from it uh well i'd like them to laugh um i laughed when i was writing it <laughs> um and so I'd like them to take away the joy of reading and laughter and uh, for it to be um, something that's an enjoyable experience for them and not something they feel they have to read. But afterwards, I'd like them to think about some of the things that the characters have been through. Mm -hmm. I have Sabrina um, has a girl that she doesn't like called Olive and they have um, a really unpleasant argument um, and Sabrina afterwards realizes that some of the things she said were mean and some of the things that she has done to Olive over time were unkind and come from, came from her jealousy. Um, and so she steps up and apologizes and she apologizes in front of the same people that she insulted Olive in front of. And she felt that that mattered. Um, and her friends and um, um, encouraged her to do, to do the right thing. So I'd like people to understand that 
it's important to take responsibility. You know, we all have, it's e too, too easy to point the finger of blame. And I, one of my clear messages from a headmistress at school was when she, I hope I can say this, she said, I'll point, if you point the finger at blame, of blame at someone, say it's your fault, there are always these three fingers pointing right back at you and we have to accept that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not always easy to recognise when we have done something bad and admit to it. It's human nature to try and blame the other person. So I hope people are brave enough um, to have that life lesson. So I think that's one of the key things that I'd like people to take from the book. That's great because it is so true that it's so easy to deflect. It's so easy to blame how we're feeling, how we respond or how we yeah. react in life that it's based on them that's caused us to do this. And um, by taking ownership, personal responsibility of your own actions, it really gives you back your power, your sense of power in understanding that I realize I misspoken, I took the wrong action or inaction mm -hmm. and that by understanding and realizing it personally then you can have your own power to say how do I want to now move forward and not be triggered not to be fueled to act inappropriately or speak inappropriately because so often that is what we see happens in life I know and it's understanding our motivations sometimes um, I found your um, book particularly pow powerful <laughs> um, at helping understand myself and where I was coming from um, as well. And, you know, that's the same kind of thing for Sabrina thinking, oh, I was jealous. So that's why I did what I did. Right, right. And I think it's so important. I think, thank you for bringing on my book, because I think so often in life, we don't realize there is a, um, a footprint, an energetic footprint of what's really fueling how we look at life how we even envision our future. What is our future going to look like? If you feel like your parents were uneducated, they always struggled, never had enough money for this or that, and you feel that's what your future looks like, then that's what you're going to create because you don't see this beautiful opportunity, this beautiful potential in yourself, in your life. And yes, so yes. By looking at our past, by looking at, like you say, that, um, that imprint of what fueled that jealousy of you creating that response or that action um, can really start to change how we act in life. And, and our young children, I'm sure in New Zealand too, um, there's a lot of bullying that might be going on there, power struggles. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Do you still have mm -hmm. the same conflicts that we have in the United States? Of course, yes, <laughs> unfortunately, yes, absolutely. Bullying is a, a concern. And, you know, thanks to the internet, um, it's so easy as well nowadays. You can bully all around the world. That's true, um, not just on yeah. the playground, yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I love that. What else would you like um, for the listeners here that are watching this video to hear about your story, uh, about your storyline yeah. of care? I love the way you create the character development and also the way I was about a third of the way through the book, um, just the uh, apparel that you have them wearing, you know, and kind of in a fantasy type area. Uh, and, yeah. Um, so um, do you want to tell a little bit more about the story? Sure. The, the story tell is, um, I, I'm a stepmother, as I said, and my stepdaughter's mother is a stepdaughter as well. She has remarried after um, their relationship broke up. And so we both know that it's, um, difficult because for me I love my stepdaughter as much as a mother did but people um, in literature kind of think oh you must be the wicked stepmother <laughs> um, and so I put a little bit about the stepmother in the story but effectively it, um, Sabrina doesn't trust her stepmother she's very defensive of her dad and she follows her stepmother and persuades her best friend Persis and to come with her and follow the stepmother into a field. And while they are there, they realise that the stepmother is um, a witch and perhaps she shouldn't have been trusted after all. Um, and then Sabrina persists, Sabrina's schoolyard enemy, who is Olive, and Sabrina's um, rather annoying younger brother, <laughs> who is called Rory, um, are all transported to this strange and so all four children find themselves accidentally transported to a very strange land called Dralfinia, which in fact is just an anagram of fairyland, mm -hmm. um, when all the traditional old fairy tale characters are there. 
And it's often, we often think, oh, it would be so lovely to be a princess. And she discovers it's not, it's not lovely at all. Um, and they have to live on their wits and they're hopelessly out of their depth, really. <laughs> so they have a number of adventures and the story really centers around being able to get home. Um, there are three books in the trilogy and each one is named after a particular magic object that they have to get. And in order to get the three magic objects, someone becomes um, the ruler of Dralfinia. So the first object is a flying carpet, but the, fly, the magical objects all have their own quirks. Nothing in life is simple. If you want something, <laughs> there are usually barriers to overcome. And in this case, the flying carpet it, is extremely uncooperative and it behaves really like a bucking bronco and tries to kick them off. And so they, um, you know, the, th the first book is about whether or not they manage to get home. And if they do get home, um, are they going to be so grounded um, for life, which is one of their worries? And um, what will they find when they get home? They've gone to a strange land. What might come back with them? And so the, the stories follow that um, traditional old-fashioned story time quest book um, theme, yeah. really. I really love that. And I didn't get it all the way home yet because I haven't finished the book. But I love that because I think, like you said, that so often we have parents or different family dynamics, whether it's adopted, whether it's a step person, whether you're so one parent family, yeah. whether it's your grandparents raising you in that. So often we may view that parent structure um, as dysfunctional at time or not providing you what you feel you need as that child, as Sabrina, and that um, there is struggles and, and challenges that we have to as children yeah. overcome and how we might want to try to not physically run away, but in a fantasy world, how do we escape this? How do we yeah. um, protect ourselves and how do we change that dynamic? Mm -hmm. And so... Uh Yes, and what can they, yes, exactly. What can Sabrina do to make it better? What can she do to make it change the world to suit her? Yeah, and at the end, yeah. what do they want to do is return back home because, you know, like yeah. Dorothy with <laughs> Wizard of Oz, they yeah. no back home. And yeah. I often say the weeds grow just like they do on this side of the street, on the other side. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's so um, true. That's um, just as weedy in New Zealand as it was back home in England. Exactly. <laughs> <clears throat> so I, I really love that. I think it's a playful story. It allows um, you to look at life in a very whimsical way and um, yeah. many, yeah. many wonderful um, storylines that if a child wants to look at it more moralistically or what can they really take mm -hmm. away from strength and yeah. leadership and own inner growth, it's all there too for them. So that, that's really yeah. magical. That's right. They can enjoy it just for fun and love the story. Um, or they can um, study it and take lessons from it. Right. And I've prepared, um, and I'm sorry for the children that might not enjoy them, but for the <laughs> teachers out, the other teachers out there, there's a set of worksheets, which is free to download, so te teachers can just take them. Um, if they use the book as a class set or read the book out loud in class, um, so that, you know, there's, and, and they're suitable for dyslexics and reluctant readers and um, bookworms, you know, for all, for all kinds of children. So the worksheets work for them all and hopefully they're um, fun as well. That's wonderful. So where can the teachers or anybody, even as someone's reading the book, where can they get the workshop, or the worksheet? Um, if you go to my website, which is mcmauthor.com um, and it's just on the link that says education, I think. Oh, great. Perfect. Yeah. And I want to also have you acknowledge what you um, share with me in your bio about um, any one, any book that's been ordered for the dyslexia friendly book. Oh, Go yeah. ahead. I'll let you finish. Yeah, I've thank you. Um, I've been lucky. I approached the American Dyslexia Association um, and like many associations, they're they're not funded by they're only funded by charitable means and I'm able to advocate on their behalf and every copy of the dyslexia friendly book that is sold I'll contribute a dollar um, from the from that sale to uh, to them as a charity. That's wonderful and that's so, very gracious and I think it's it's perfect with align with what you're trying to do not just yeah. in the story but having the specific book um, published where it's actually 
um, user friendly for dyslex dyslexia. So that's really wonderful. Yeah, I believe in giving back. I'm, I don't know if you were the same as me, but when I had my phone call and then email from Morgan James saying that they would publish the book, I was thrilled. I was dancing around the room, right. and um, so it was you know it's always been my dream and. Um, for me, when you get good news, it, you don't just keep it to yourself, you pay it forwards as well and pass, pass the love on. So that's my way of doing that for this Well, we're very book. fortunate. Morgan James is a wonderful Christian publishing um, house and there are yeah. people there, all the staff and David, the owner, uh, the founder is, is just amazing. So if you're looking for a publisher, you might want to check out Morgan James Publishing House. Um, Absolutely. Yes, for sure. <laughs> Now, I know your book is um, available worldwide. You can get it through Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, Books of yep. Millions. Um, and are they able to also order it or um, on your website as well? Um, it comes out on the 7th of August. So it's actually available to purchase on the 7th of August. All the ebooks are available on the 1st of May. Um, and if people want to buy a signed copy from the author um, there's a link on my website as well so that would, it's under the um, the tab that says books and I will post those um, out to people who want to sign copy perfect wonderful well I'm so excited and I think your book is so whimsical and fun and like you said you want the children to laugh when they read it I'm really yeah. enjoying it kind of me take me back oh, to my younger days so thank you very much for sharing it with me and the world and I wish you much success with it. I oh, thank you. you. Now, when will you release the other two volumes of the trilogy? Um, well, I'll talk to my contact at Morgan James. Um, I just thought I'd see how this one goes on the 7th yeah. of August. But, and if they're, they're keen, and I certainly would be keen to work with them again, then as soon as possible after that one, after the other, they're written and they're ready to go. <laughs> oh, great. So even if it's every six mm -hmm. months or every year, whatever. Yeah, every six months would be perfect. Perfect. Yeah. That's great. Well, yeah. again, thank you so much for being here and I wish you much success and um, continue writing those short stories. Yes, I will. And thank you so much, Cindy. I really appreciate you doing this. My <laughs> pleasure. Take care and thank you all for being with me and Michelle mm -hmm. and I wish you a very blessed day. And enjoy your reading and allow the wisdom that comes from those pages to fall within <laughs> your heart. Take care.